stuff that keeps, I think, most of us up at night in, in a human rights lens. And that includes special education, school discipline, culturally um, and linguistically responsive and appropriate teaching, mm -hmm. um, and also you know, language access, physical access, all that kind of stuff. Um, all of that really comes under the rubric of human rights. And I wanted to, one of the things I really wanted to do today is give you all the framework to talk about it in that sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to do is point out the tension points where some of these things collide with each other. Um, because I think that's honestly a space where we can be most effective in our advocacy work and conversation. So, sound like a plan? Does that sound like what you want? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so my name is Maria Boyer. I work at Advocates for Justice and Education here at the District of Columbia's Parent Training and Information Center. Um, some of you have heard this spiel before, but we are the little tiny parent training and information center. There are six of us. We get a little tiny bit of money from the federal government to equalize parents' interactions with the school district. So let's just kind of contemplate that. There are six of us, <laughs> and we are supposed to put parents on an equal footing with their LEA, their local educational agency, when we interact with them. So yes, she's making a face. Yes, that is like not a possible thing for us to do. We try really hard, um, and we are a mighty staff of six, but it's, it's, it's a tough road. Um, a little bit about me. I, I am an attorney. Um, I was in private practice for about 10 years before I came to AJE. I still do a little bit of litigation, but not nearly as much as I used to do. And one of the reasons why I transitioned to litigation, transitioned away from litigation, is that um, I had gotten into special education law um, and originally special education, period, um, because I wanted to see change. I wanted to see better outcomes for our kids. I wanted to see more equity. Um, so I thought, well, I kind of had to sue people. I'm winning these cases. This is going to be awesome. We're going to see lots of changes. And I won a lot of cases. And I saw no changes. And then I'd file the same case again and again and again. Um, and I worked in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And I could see like little incremental progress in Virginia and Maryland. I saw nothing happening in response to my litigation in DC. And I kind of came to realize that that was because the people at the table um, we're not respecting and hearing the voice of the community, the student, the parent, um, and the teacher a lot of times, especially in DC. And I kind of came to realize that the way I was gonna get the change I wanted to see wasn't through litigation, but it was gonna be through um, the much harder work <laughs> of um, community education and empowerment. I um, mean, creating that capacity to really push. Um, and that can be through voting, that can be just through helping parents and be, be better advocates at the table on a micro level, and then once they get comfortable with that, helping them be better advocates on the macro level. So that's kind of how I came to be not in court, hanging out on Saturday mornings doing stuff like this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so we have five slides. Five. Da -da -da -da. And one of them has nothing on it. So we are not gonna spend a lot of time looking at the PowerPoint. I'm hoping to make this be a conversation. Does that, does that work? Yeah. Okay. Also, you all should know that when I did teach a million years ago, I taught in Virginia, and I'm originally from Virginia, which means that I believe wholeheartedly in the power of a story, and I also need feedback. So, you know, just pretend, just nod, give me something. Um, and then if, I, if you ask me a question and I start to tell you a story, not ignoring your question, I will get to it. It's just that I believe in the narrative. Yeah. Okay? All right. So here's kind of the big, the big thing we're doing, right? We're gonna do human rights for a minute. We're gonna do like the, not even 40,000, 60,000, we're gonna look at human rights like from outer space. Okay, we're gonna get the world's biggest overview on education as a human right, but also all of the other human rights that are interacting with us at school. Um, including, I think, organizing is an important one to talk about. And I also wanna talk a little bit about the difference between a human right and a civil right those are actually, they have different intellectual origins, and they have a different, there's a different kind of weight to them. So I want to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of education. This is going to be where I get to show off the fact that I've read, you know, education is a public good, and I'm, I'm all into that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to show off a little bit of critical race theory stuff here. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the state. 
And one of the hardest things I think in my conversations with teaching folks sometimes is that I'll talk about the role of the state, and then I'll say, well, you know, don't forget teachers are agents of the state. And then I get a bunch of teachers who look at me like, I am not an agent of the state. I am a force of liberation. <laughs> and thank you, yes, I want you to be a force of liberation. But you're also an agent of the state. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's one of the biggest tensions, I think, um, for all of us during this work. And candidly, I, I live in that tension too. I think I'm a force for liberation, and I'm an attorney, and I reify a rather oppressive legal system every day. So I feel you. Okay, so we're gonna muck around in that for a minute. And then I'm gonna close my eyes, and you guys are gonna figure out how you can take all this information and do something amazing with it. And then I'm gonna do something in the afternoon about it. Does that sound like a reasonable plan? Mm -hmm. Is there anything up there where you're like, that's not what I came here for, and I need Maria to talk about X? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. So what in God's name is a human right? What was the question? What's a human right? And what are some of them? I think that's an easier one for some of us. So I can, I can take a stab at human rights. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that it's um, any right that is afforded to a human. Okay, so that's a key word. We're gonna hang on to afforded. Keep going. Um, you want me to elaborate on afforded? Okay, so I think, you know, when I think any person that's born, so whether, regardless of the age or uh -huh. what have you, there are certain things that you have a right to. So, um, and when we get into talking about, you know, basic rights, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that we all have basic rights. I mean, education being one of them, okay. um, starting from, I, th I believe, birth. Okay. So this is perfect. So afforded birth. Who is is there a granting body for a human right? No. No. You you have it. Period. You get a bonus sticker yeah. for being the first one to talk. When I think ha, of ha, ha. when I think of rights, I think of there ha there has to be a way to enforce it, or it's not a right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I guess I mean maybe the right exists without the enforcement mechanism, but without an enforcement, what good is it? The right versus duty tension is, is huge. Okay. Um, where's the right versus duty? And then we'll put this up in a minute. Oh. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about afforded. Because does anyone give you a human right? Or is that something you're born with and it's inalienable? Inalienable, it can't be taken away from you. I believe you're born with it and it's inalienable. That's, that's exactly correct. So human rights don't have a legal underpinning. Civil rights have a legal underpinning. They're from civil society. Human rights are Essentially, the things we talk about when we're talking about human dignity. Okay, now um, the right to an education is one of the many human rights that's in play in our school. Right, but the right to communicate is another one. Um, the right to food safety. Um, interestingly enough, the UN also recognizes a human right to collective action, um, which puts me in tension. a right to collective action, a right to speech, a right to community. So these are all kind of huge, big things. And then they get made real through our civil rights. So stuff like Language Access Act. That makes real the human right of communication. Okay. IDEA makes real the right to an appropriate education. Okay. Um, it makes real the right to employment. Everyone has a right to work. Um, they do not have a job they want, but they have a right to participate in society, and education is how we do those things. So civil rights are how we make those rights real. And I think one of the hard things for us sometimes is that a lot of these rights exist very much in tension. Okay? For example, um, you say very much what? Intention. Intention. Okay. Right. So parents, for example, have a right to direct the educational outcomes of their children. They have a right to pick schools. They have a right um, to homeschool. But the child also has a right to an education. This is one of the easiest places to see these rights in tension. Because what if the child goes home with the parent, is homeschooled, and receives no education? 
that's the easiest place to see that competing right place. Um, but there's other places to see it. Um, we see it in terms of you know, teacher safety, unfortunately, is a place where we see it play out a lot. Um, you know, people have a right to be safe at work, and students have a right to an appropriate education. There, there's a tension there sometimes. Um, another, where else do we see these tensions? That teacher safety one is on my mind because, of course, you know, parents never want to see their children restrained or secluded. But you know, having been in situations where things have gotten very dangerous, it's it feels like, well, what can we do that protects us in a way that also protects the dignity of the student? Right. And I would argue one of the things we push for, and I would argue is the appropriate thing to push for, is training. Yeah. DCPS has an incredibly robust policy around restraint and seclusion that's currently enacted and hidden away and not published on the website and that no one knows about. Mm. But it's one of the best policies. It was written two administrations ago. It was based on some work in the federal with Congress and some really good people wrote it. And no one's been trained on it. <clears throat> What's the value? It's the, I will email it to you. Right? <laughs> I will post it on Twitter. And everybody can have it. But it's the um, restraint and seclusion policy. Um, and it's kind of been tucked away and hidden. Yeah, mm. yeah no one knows about it. Um, which is frustrating. When I think of language rights, too, and communication mm -hmm. rights, I've heard administrators say, we want to hire more bilingual educators, but they just don't apply for the jobs, or they don't, we don't find them. So I mean, I guess that's not really attention, but it's just a, a reality, a logistical reality of how do you find the ways or the resources you need to protect a right. Right, and I think that's the other part. Like we, we filed a state complaint around not having enough special education teachers, right? right? Because kids have a right to an appropriate education, they have a right to, that means they have a right to a teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, and the reality is, is that it's very hard to find enough special educators. Um, now some of that goes to how we treat our special educators, how we pay our special educators, and also say that's particularly true in the charter sector where they are radically underpaid um, and not required to be certified, which doubles, which is a double tension, because that undermines both their ability to demand compensation and our ability to demand our being the parent voice, our ability to demand a certain degree of like, excellence and competency there. They're not required to be certified at all. So it's a real tension. So mm -hmm. with, with that, I just wanted to add that uh -huh. I am a special educator, so um, the implementation and the way that mm -hmm. um, the district chooses to um, ignore IDEA and just come up with all these policies or these district procedures that have nothing to do with the students uh, IEP or with what's best for mm -hmm. the students and the IEP is supposed to drive their education, it's supposed to drive the placement, and that's not what's happening. Right, because we under resource it, yes, right? That too. And, and then when we're under resourced, we can't do the thing that we said we were going to do. Yes. Right, which makes it hard to say we have this capacity issue. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so you see, we are in outer space on human rights. Okay. I could talk about the UNCRPD, you know, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and I could write, talk about the UN Resolution on the Rights of the Child. We're not going to do that, because this is 25 minutes. But if you want further reading, that's where you look. Okay? And I would also say one of the great things about IDEA, which is candidly my favorite law that was passed in 1975, same year I was born, is that it very clearly articulates the says the point of all this is to encourage students to or give them the skills they need to seek further education and employment, have in, be independent living, have achieve as independent living as possible for them, and three, um, be employed. Those are at their core human rights goals. You know, so I happen to think of all our education laws that we have out there, in many ways ID in many ways IDEA is the most advanced and enlightened because it talks about the full human experience of the child, and it talks about the point and the purpose and the outcome of education, um, which I think is far better than charter schools, <laughs> um, and far more important. All right. Where did you find that? 1979? So it was passed in 1975. IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, and it's my favorite law, and that's in the preamble to the law. And if you go to our website, you can see it in our website. Um, okay, but 
that's, yes. I mean, I would say IDEA is really, and I'm gonna get on my soapbox and my special educator friend is gonna be happy for a second. I think special education deserves credit for every single interesting educational innovation that's happened in this country in the last 25 years. Hmm. Social emotional learning, that's IDEA. PDIS, that's IDEA. Data-driven analysis, that's IDEA. Teacher accountability, IDEA. There are no teachers in this country who has to testify in a hearing about whether or not they did a good job, except for special educators. That's radical. The idea of a right that's enforceable, IDEA. There is no right of action for general education kids in this country. Kids can't sue for educational malpractice. But an IDEA, they can sue. That's radical. Radical, radical, radical. I love it. Yes? Sorry to interrupt. Just so you know, the second session is starting, but I know we got started. Yeah. So we can, you can, this could be a double session to go deeper. So okay. it's uh, up to you, and then other people can trickle in. Okay. <laughs> I will not throw things at her. <laughs> All right, so the purposes of education. We just kind of talked about it with IDEA, which makes it very explicit. Hello. All right. Hello. I will not be mad. All right. Why do we do this thing that we're doing? Like, what's the point of education? We can talk about micro and macro. What's the point of this thing that we're all doing? And I know it's not to get paid to job. I'm going to hit that one. Neither do I. We just missed the human rights overview, but that's okay. It was very high level and boring. Okay. <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing here? And this, I gave you a starter. Uh, micro and macro purposes. So we're getting the kids for you. Right. We're getting right budgets and math, and that's all awesome and great. But what, what are we doing here? What's the purpose? Just to be a, um, I mean, a productive member of society. A productive member of society, right? And that's part of that is to participate in the democratic decision making process, right? To create a more just and representative community. Good morning. All right, what else are we doing here? Uh, teaching skills. Yes. Skills to be employable, yeah. right? Well, I, I also use education as a means to break the cycle of oppression. Yes. Oh, see, she she didn't actually miss the human rights part, did she? <laughs> she psychically knew it was there. We're going to jump to the end of this. She knew, and it was exciting. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, so create workers, so to create to break, you know, and the tension there with the breaking the cycle of poverty, honestly, is sometimes you have this credentialing system, which almost sometimes feels like it's reifying it. And then we're trying to give our kids tools to be upwardly mobile, um, allow for individualization and individualized self master you know, that whole self-direction in life, which again, first paragraph of IDEA. Now this is my moment of tension that makes me sad. Sometimes in education, we are very much also doing this. We're re we, we act and we reify and we reaffirm existing social inequities. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the hardest things for us to acknowledge and deal with. Um, but that's why some schools don't have teachers, quite literally. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why some schools are structurally underfunded and under-resourced, is because we have no intention of liberating these kids. None whatsoever. Um, and that can be because maybe we want to create a leader class. I don't know. It would be the little bit of marks I did in undergrad a long time ago. You know? um, but it's, it's one of the hardest parts of this. So the purposes of education are all, all over the place. Okay? Now we're gonna talk about that part that was made teachers frowny. Mm -hmm. Schools as state actors and agents of the state, and teachers as agents of the state. So we acknowledge kids have a human right to school, right? We acknowledge that every single person has a human right, and we all exist with that human right, and we have it, we hold it, we love it, right? And who runs our schools? Um, so oh, sometimes, jacket. <laughs> <laughs> also, that is not our favorite people all the time. Yeah, and this is one of the hard places, especially when we run into school discipline issues. Um, you know, one of my personal, I will just tell you the lens that I see this through the most often, is um, we have a kid who does something they shouldn't do at school. Okay, and it's a pretty significant thing they weren't supposed to do, whatever it was. You know, maybe they bathroom, maybe they, you know, pushed another kid, maybe they pushed a teacher, maybe they destroyed property, maybe they set up the sprinkler system and did thousands of dollars at the school, okay, whatever they did, it was a big one, maybe they had lots of drugs.
drugs and the kids do that too. And break into the computer school system. Did that too. Had all those. They did some. The dean of students takes that child and says, um, kiddo, come with me. Actually, he usually says, son, come with me. And he goes into a small room. And it's just his office. It's a small room. It's a closed, tight space. has a relationship, respects that adult. <sighs> Writes down everything he does. Every pre-defense attorney in America's heart breaks as he does that. Mm -hmm. Right? Because what has that child done? Made a confession. Incriminated himself, mm -hmm. confessed to an agent of the state. Mm -hmm. And that confession is now going to be used in criminal justice proceedings and in school discipline proceedings. And he was never notified of anything. Never once. So I think that's the most obvious place where we see school as agent of the state being a problem. But there's other places where we see it as well. Um, we see it in how we talk about social justice. We see it in how we talk about student activism. Um, and it, it's a complicated spot, and I don't have an easy solution. I don't like what the deans do with the little rooms. That's an easy solution for me. I'm just like Miranda would apply in that situation. Um, unfortunately, not everyone agrees with Maria, so I'm still working on that. Um, but that's, that's a source of tension. Does that resonate? Are there other places where the agent, the part of the state, the agency of the state, becomes a factor in this conversation? The place where I feel it in elementary school is the relationship between schools and CFSA and having to report. That's just like one of the most heartbreaking times of my career when I have to make a call to CFSA. So CFSA is a, a really good spot. And I think we see that a lot, especially I would say in educational neglect matters. That's that's a huge one. And that's an, un, that's an inequality there too, right? Because parents can't call schools for educational neglect, right? Parents don't have a mechanism to say, well, I, my kid didn't have a teacher this week, right? right? But if the school, if the child is in that school for a week, that triggers, that can trigger CFSA. Um, what's another? What's another detention place? Attendance. Attendance, right? What's with you know reinforcers? What are we doing here? What's what's one last one that you guys are killing me by not mentioning? Suspensions. Suspensions. That's a big one. It's bigger. Go back to that like big thing. Something about students' interaction with SROs um, and security officers. SROs and security officers. How are schools funded? Oh, money. Money. That's another huge, huge tension point for this. Because our communities are frequently paying for this and not getting full access to what they're paying for. Right? So that's another huge, huge spot for this. Um, sound good? Mm -hmm. Yay! OK, those of y'all who came in, I love you very much. We're going to have to stay and hang out for my human rights part. It's <laughs> sad if you don't. We'll just do a continue loop. <laughs> all right, so now we're going to concretize all this. See, I really did plan this for you. It's just on our schedule. OK, so language access communication, huge issue, right? When we concretize this, language access. Do parents have access to the school in the language of their, yes, ma'am? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, OK. Was... Right. So how do we connect all this like mushy up here, human rights, civil rights stuff, to real classroom stuff? Language access is one. Right? Um, do y'all know that you can use a language line anytime? Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't believe it if they tell you you can't. My access to the language line is capped and a budget issue. Your access to the language line is not. I am a nonprofit. You guys are the government. Okay? You get access to the language line whenever you want it and how as often as you need it. Okay? Do you guys know you have to translate IEPs and evaluations? Mm -hmm. All of them. Okay? All right, physical access, transportation. Let's talk a little bit about transportation. How many of you guys have kids coming from all over the city? How many of you guys have kids with more than a two hour commute? I know you do. Who else? Just to call you out randomly. I go to school on Saturday morning. Right, anybody else have kids with, you think, more than a two hour commute? You'd be shocked if you're um, 
kind of on the top side of the city, you've got kids with two hour commutes. Because they're coming from seven and eight up to like, you know, three. Okay, that's a huge commute. Okay? And if you don't have if you don't have access, do you have access to your education really? If you're looking at a two hour commute? Hey, hey! Maybe? Yes? No? Is the access to your education, is that equal access? If you know your friend gets to walk across the street, whereas you've got to be on a bus for two hours, maybe it's stressful and dangerous? Or you're constantly late. Or you're constantly late. Right. So I think, trans I think we need to really take a second and think about the transportation issues and access, not just in terms of physical access to the building, not just in terms of can I get to the building, can I register, is there space in the building for me, you know, but do I get the same access? You know, if it's three at two, three hours for me to get to school, what am I missing out on in the rest of my life? All right, this is one we've talked a little bit about this, the rights of parents versus the rights of students and how there's a tension there sometimes. Um, we already talked a little bit about homeschooling. All right, now we're gonna do my favorite part, which is special education. You guys have already heard my rant about how special education has all the best ideas in education and has had all the best ideas in education for a very long time. But we struggle with this. Kids under IDEA have a right to free appropriate public education in a restrictive environment. There is a huge tension there, right? There's this tension between appropriateness and inclusion, okay? And the reality is we don't have segregated adulthood unless we're talking about institutions. Institutions are generally hospitals and prisons. We don't like that, right? But how do we get our kids to a place where there's the appropriateness and the inclusionary elements are not fighting each other all the time. That's a hard one, and that requires that funding part, and that requires that community capacity to create it. So we've talked about this a little bit already, and this is the thing we haven't talked about. And seeing how we have so many beautiful new people, we're gonna spend time on this one. The right to community and culture. That's a human right, we talked about that at the very beginning. The right to culturally responsive teaching, the right to re relevant teaching, the right to linguistically responsive teaching, appropriate pieces. So what on earth does it look like to actualize a right to community and culture in your classroom? What does that even remotely look like? Ask the question in here, please. Sure. What does it look like to actualize the human right of a right to community and culture? Because every person has a right to community and every person has a right to their culture. Okay? And language is part of that. So what does it look like when we actualize that right in our classrooms? Yes, ma'am. Uh, one way is to get to know who your students are. Okay. And if you want you, and even their languages that they speak, and every now and then you incorporate their language when you're speaking or teaching them. Okay, so language, mm -hmm. oh. knowing your students, yes, sir? I was just trying to put this down, but I was. <laughs> well, I was just gonna put I, you on the spot. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, so I think about my classroom, um, there's reflections of each part of my students inside the classroom in terms of like images and pictures, art on the wall, um, people, like, and even through my planning. So if the topic is on overcoming adversity right now in unit two, almost everybody we talk about are people who look like them and talk like them and the issue they have. So for example, we're going to talk about Elijah and Cummings. Mm -hmm. um, when we come back, third grade, we're going to talk about Elijah and Cummings. Um, even though it's not part of our unit. <laughs> it's going to be part of your unit because you're going to talk about it. Yeah. So I think that's key, right? P yeah. Content in the classroom that you see yourself in. I would also argue that teachers that you see yourself in is incredibly important. Yes, ma'am? Um, something we do in my classroom is set norms okay. together. I, no, you're good. <laughs> um, setting norms together with mm -hmm. your students since we all come in with you know different backgrounds at home, different cultures. Mm -hmm. and creating a classroom where everybody can feel like the way that we speak to each other mirrors some way that we speak to each other at home or, you know, so letting the kids come up with a lot of the structures in the classroom okay. in a collaborative way. Okay. So like letting them bring in and define and create that classroom culture. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, ma'am? Oh, is that a stretch? No. <laughs> you guys can guess at the end of this based on how I do this, what grade is. <laughs> I was going to just add on again to the same point about um, race and ethnicity and all those things. I also talk about sexuality, mm -hmm. like, which is something that a lot of people share, shy away from, but it is a reflection of 
our community. And um, for an example, we were reading a book, a Bia Obama, 2008 speech, and there was a line that talked about whether your sex, uh, pre-homosexuality, and this is the kids all started laughing. Um, so I paused it there, and we talked about it and had a conversation about it. Um, my school is very big on non-gender conforming, mm -hmm. um, non-binary type of things, and so we create a safe space for it, so get your laughs out now, because this is our community. So I can't, we can't forget that part of it. So. I think it's hugely important, and again, right, community and culture is, is, an, is an expansive thing, right? And I would point out that within DCPS, every single school has a designated liaison for our LGBTQ kids. Um, that's not true in um, the charter sector necessarily, although a lot of them do have somebody. But every school in DCPS has a targeted, has a person <coughs> who is supposed to be the safe person for that school. Um, yes, ma'am? I was just adjusting my glasses, but. Um, <laughs> you can have an apology sticker. Uh, I love it. Thank you so much. Sorry. No, you're fine. Um, but when you said language, I was just thinking also not only, um, I was thinking more so of like dialects. Yes. And like um, just acceptance of like the dialect or like the language that our students use and not, um, how do I say it, making it like a bad Um, we are not going to pathologize the culture that a child brings to school. We are not going to say that a child who is speaking the way that they have been taught and the way that they've heard their entire life, we are not going to say in this hypothetical IEP meeting <coughs> that this child needs speech and language therapy because you have not heard them articulate TH the way you think they should articulate TH. They have been articulating TH the way they've heard their mother, their grandma, and every aunt, uncle, and adult in their life say it. So until we have decided that you know what we're doing is not pathologizing their culture and their communication, we're not going to make this kid go to speech therapy because we're not going to pathologize it that way. We're not going to call it a deficit. Is that did I say it right? Yes, thank you. It took me like ten years to do that. Okay. So don't. <laughs> that was like ten years of work right there. All right, but that's a great example, right, of respecting culture because we're not going to pathologize culture. Um, we're not going to pathologize someone's story and their life experience and how they present at school. Now, what's another way, and I, I want to bring this back to transportation, rights of community and transportation. Are those linked? Do we see a connection there? Uh, can you break it again? Sure. So do we see a connection between physical access to schools, transportation, and the rights of culture and the rights of community? Do we see any kind of connection there? I'm thinking about kids coming, you know, from neighborhoods far away and then coming to a school and then the neighbors complaining about the behavior of these kids outside this school and they're not, they're neighborhood kids. So it's like, it's disconnecting, you know, the students from the community that they're schooling in and the community's not really feeling like, well, these are, they're coming, you know, it's, they're othering them because they're right. coming from somewhere else. Right. So, and what have these kids lost in that process? Right. Like a, a neighborhood that cares about them. Sorry. Yes. I think there's, there's definitely that, but I also think there's just the other parts of after school. So the after school activities, the uh, extracurriculars, all the things that occur after school that aren't necessarily connected to an IEP or have the same type of level of services. Right. And I would say also just stepping, and I don't like to do this, stepping aside from disability entirely. You know, when we have a kid going across town for their education, they are no longer, they don't have access right now to their neighborhood school. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that neighborhood school had value, let's say. And there, there is inherent value in having an educational institution in and of that community. And that child no longer has access to that. And I think this is another space where we see not having a teaching core that's representative of the community that we're teaching. That's another place where we see um, the rights of community and culture really in tension with transportation and access. Um, and I would say language is another huge part of this. Um, and not just language like the language we speak. My name is Maria. I don't speak any Spanish. It's very embarrassing. Um, you know, but not.
not just the language, but also how we communicate and how we listen. A lot of the work I do is translating parents' voice into voices that schools can hear. Okay? I'm done. Um, I don't want to have to take you back, but the, the, the whole access that, that goes into funding, mm -hmm. um, the issue with um, funding that we're not just facing this right now, but we've been facing for a long time, that causes those students to have to travel uptown to get what they can't get at their neighborhood school. And I was also going to say about the right to um, education and the access to a teacher, not just a teacher, but a good teacher. Yes. 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 A good teacher and a effective teacher. And if, we, if I add on to what you're saying, um, to that point of the effective teacher and to the communication back down to the community, you have um, that whole idea of gentrification. And back to your point earlier where you're saying, hey, my school is changing because of the neighborhood that's changing around it, but the population of students that are still coming there because of faith, because of the school, is not overall changing. So I still have the same issues. For example, my school still suffers from issues of displacement of home. Um, it was once in an area where it was a lots of drugs and lots of crime. So those issues are still around there. There's still big homeless communities and things are around there, but yet you have seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollar homes and you want the issues to change because your home is and then you want the school to change vice versa, but you haven't attacked the real community issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that the the one of the hardest things for me and I think for a lot of us I suspect, um, is that we can't solve any of the issues in education in just education. Mm -hmm. Right, which was you know heartbreaking for me because I would say this is one I've been doing most of my professional life. Um, you know, we can't talk about it without talking about tax policy, housing policy, and all those connected issues. Um, okay, do we feel like we have connected the mucky, mucky very beginning to something real? That's good because the last slide is one where I don't talk at all, and maybe it's what you guys think about in the afternoon. I've kind of done a double session now. So let me ask this, because I'm looking at the time. I can start at the beginning and do the outer space view of human rights for Yaga Cane Lake and let those of you who started us off escape gracefully. <laughs> or I can be very quiet and let you guys talk for a minute. And if you want to put your social media there, you can, or you can just all follow me and listen to my rants and waves. <laughs> About three jurisdictions, by the way, mostly DC, but I do Maryland and Virginia so much. Um, so what do you want? Choices are start over and let some of you gracefully slide out. I be quiet and facilitate communication. Or I, don't know, I guess I could leave the next part, but I don't really want to do that. Really? Yeah, I'm going to do the first part anyway, no matter what. So. All right. Talk, okay. We'll do talk. So the next session, right next session starts at 11.25. Um, okay. So maybe for those who missed the first part, they can, they, if they wanted to, they could stay for, well, then they missed the first then part. Then they missed the first part. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we never, there's never a lot of opportunities where a lot of teachers get to get together like this, so I think it's powerful to have well, so let me plug for this same room in the afternoon. We are kind of going to be talking about how how do we take all these thorny, sticky stuff and like actually put it into practice at schools. Um, that is what the in-depth session in the afternoon is, is going to be around too. Um, of course, you only get to go to one in the afternoon. There's going to be a lot of ones to choose from. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I made my 